Hello and welcome to Reach Live. It's 2023 uh, and we're here to again for this year bringing you leaders within digital health. I'm Rena Such. I'm the head of digital and connected health at Ipsos and my focus is all things digital health and evidence generation which makes me really excited about the guests that we have on Reach Live today. Susan, welcome to Reach Live and please give an introduction to yourself. Yes, thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm Susan Persky. I direct the Immersive Simulation Program and head the Health Communication and Behavior Unit in the Social and Behavioral Research Branch of the National Human Genome Research Institute of the National Institutes of Health. We have a lot of layers in the government. It's always hard to know how far to go, um, but I think that'll do it. Um, so I am a behavioral scientist and I study um, all things related to um, immersive technologies, genomics, healthcare, um, health communication, and a variety of other topics that kind of come together in, I think, really interesting ways uh, when it comes to emerging tech and health um, and ways that we can leverage our tech to make um, emerging healthcare options more equitable and more effective. Incredible, quite quite a remit from uh, yeah. the genome from the genome to the virtual world. <laughs> You're kind of covering it all. The whole the whole stack. Yep. Um, so tell me, what what led you first to be interested in this space? I'm kind of intrigued because you're you're hitting on so many areas which are so important for the future, and we're going to get into applications of of that for the future. But what is it for you that led you into this field? Yeah, I mean, it probably would be more accurate to you know, or easier to at least say that I um, study the psychology of emerging tech in a lot of ways mm. um, and, and that translation because I really started with uh, the emerging, uh, I'm sorry, the immersive technologies um, early in my career. So I am a social psychologist by training. Um, I went to the University of California, Santa Barbara to get my doctorate degree. And there was this brand new lab environment that was looking at um, how virtual reality um, which was certainly not a thing in the uh, very late 90s when I was uh, coming into the, the university, uh, but how virtual reality might influence um, and what it can tell us about ourselves psychologically and interpersonally. Um, so really leveraging VR for social research. Um, my, my dissertation work back in those days was um, how using VR to experience and play violent video games might influence us, influence us in terms of um, aggressive behavior and so on. Um, you know, well before that became an actual relevant thing in society, but conceptually and psychologically, a really, really interesting topic. Um, you know, and once I had finished that work, I had uh, basically this this really cool and really powerful tool, um, you know, in my toolbox of methods that I could use um, for psychology and public health and other research. Um, and with that in mind, I sort of brought those capacities to that age with me. Um, so I um, started at the NIH in uh, 2005, so I've been there quite a while now. Um, and in 2006, we opened our doors. So we've really had a, a virtual reality-based research lab, um, you know, which is now called the Immersive Sim Program. It's gone through a couple of names um, over its lifetime, but we've really been around for quite a while now. Um, and we are applying a lot of these technologies to um, the big questions that arise when you think about how uh, genetic and genomic technologies are emerging and how they are going to sort of show themselves, you know, in the clinic, uh, because that translation actually tends to happen pretty fast. So these new technologies come out, they get adopted, uh, they are available direct to consumers, and we're really interested to see um, how that will unfold. Um, so in some ways, we we started by basically using VR to try and, you know, in some ways predict the future, right? So we would simulate a doctor-patient interaction, um, inject, uh, you know, some genomics content that wasn't ready to be talked about in the clinic or wasn't ready to be used. But, you know, by simulating, you know, either patient or provider and bringing in, you know, sort of a real person to play the other side, we were able to see how those uh, communications and how those recommendations might start to unfold. So that was sort of the early days of um, leveraging VR tech as um, basically a research platform or a research tool to do some simulation. Fascinating. I've played around a little bit with VR in research um, as well. And there's a lot of difference between the different elements of this area. So we're going to get into a bit of definition and busting uh, stuff. So one is just 360 video. 
right? Um, and whether you put it into a headset or not, the idea of being immersed in a 360 and you can use the scroller on a laptop or you could be completely immersed. And we did a similar thing where we had a clinician consultation happen and we asked the individual, because it felt it was in a clinic environment, to put a headset on to see their experience about the dialogue with the clinician and give feedback. Then the next level of that is um, taking it into a more avatar-based space, right? So the using... 3D, 3D technology, other imagery technology to kind of create more of an immersive. And that's been used a lot for medical education. So if, when new um, molecules are coming, or if we look at the new ways that molecules are interacting with mRNA being a very clear example of a new technology, um, which is, you know, which really has transformed healthcare, creating a um, medical education module within a virtual reality headset was being given to doctors as a way for them to be educated about it. And then I want to take it to augmented reality, this kind of you're in your in your real world, but you're putting on glasses or you're putting on some form of immersive tech and you're being able to see augmented items around you. Uh, but less so in healthcare at the minute, I can't think of an example. All I can think of is the IKEA example of me <laughs> knowing whether my piece of furniture can look like that online. Yep. And then finally, XR, which still needs demystifying this mixed reality <laughs> world, which for me is, is it not AR? So there's me laying it out. Yep. Give it to us. Where, where, how would you give us the layers from your perspective? I honestly would say this is still weirdly a little bit controversial. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I think there are different ways of breaking it up and different ways of thinking about it. So um, a lot of people do think of it on that continuum in terms of how much of what you're seeing is digital versus, mm. you know, sort of real world. Um, and so in that sense, you know, more of an augmented reality, you know, seeing if your bookshelf is going to fit. I have actually seen some really nice use cases um, around sort of surgical planning and around mm -hmm. um, education and being able to overlay uh, digital content on top of, you know, a real, either a real sort of surgical field or a, um, you know, a mannequin that you might use in, in um, physician training or something like that. So there are, you know, it's, it's up and coming. It's a little harder. The hardware isn't as far along, you know. So there are lots of reasons, but um, you know, going from there, um, and actually, I guess I would argue the continuum starts in real reality. So take <laughs> take that for what you will. Um, but going all the way to a situation where as many of your senses as possible are sort of digitally constructed, right? And so uh, virtual reality would be sort of the poster child for that, uh, because everything you're seeing is digital, um, and more and more, more of our senses are able to be sort of drawn into that that virtual experience um, and sort of envelop us even more. So that would be sort of the other end um, of the continuum. I mean, you could definitely stick 360 video somewhere in there because everything at that point, though it was once real, is now digital. Um, and so, you know, for me, a lot of it is just how much are we creating? And, um, you know, certainly the most action right now is on the virtual reality end, but I think with, you know, technology moving the way it's moving and, you know, I think different use cases sort of finding their footing in terms of what approach works best um, is really going to be um, when we're hitting those sweet spots. Um, mm -hmm. It's not going to be as much about what's easier, what's cheaper, you know, it'd be more about what kinds of applications work better for which outcomes, um, which is one of the things that, you know, I really, you know, I think is going to be a really important research area as we're moving forward. So what for you makes you believe that immersive technology is going to scale because that's been probably yeah. the biggest critique right um headset penetration is not the highest of high and it's mainly in the gaming space uh, so where where do you see that yeah i mean i a year ago may not <laughs> may have said eh, i don't know i guess we'll have to see um but i have been um to several meetings with folks from the um, U.S. Veterans Health um, Association or um, and administration, and um, they are doing amazing things towards scaling. You know, when you have sort of a coherent, not to say the VA is all coherent, but um, you know, when you have a place that values um, innovation and you have people who are there to make it happen, um, they are starting to make scaling happen. So, you know, I know that our U.S. health system is um, very complicated. So, you know, hard to say who's going to be the driver of this. But I think, um, 
you know, as the technology continues to grow, take new forms, um, you know, I, I do think that a, um, a movement from sort of telemedicine as it's happening now into the potential to have these things be, you know, far more immersive, I think, um, you know, I think that's going to become possible. Um, it will, of course, depend on, on hardware use. Um, but even if that doesn't happen, you know, even if we say, okay, we're done, you know, no more mixed reality, no more augmented reality. Um, I think that the use cases, at least sort of in op in hospital settings, in um, in the medical system itself are so appealing that I think those will persist, um, you know, even if we're not seeing it wide scale outside um, of, of clinical settings. I, mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I do think it is uh, showing really important benefits and, um, you know, will will probably stay in those kinds of environments. Um, mm -hmm. you know. In the future, Just, we're not there yet, obviously. Yeah, yeah, and you're right. There's been, there's been some compelling evidence. I mean, pain pain is one of the most famous um, clinical. Like there was a randomized controlled trial study, right, which showed the effectiveness of it at, to equivalence of drug therapy. Um, I find the stuff around maternal care, maternal health, maternal care being quite interesting, and um, mental health, behavioral health is really yeah. big here. So helping people, there's lot of movement around mindfulness um, strategies but also social anxiety like PTSD and elements like that so mm -hmm. yeah pain therapy yes. behavioral All health. Of it. Yeah, yeah I think, I think you've hit upon you know a lot of the earliest uh, best emerging you know I think there were some some use cases that emerged early mm -hmm. um, and that was because it was it's a slam it was a slam dunk right and so I think a lot of the pain uh, work emerged early um, with Hunter Hoffman and others um, out in Washington and then, you know, California, um, you know, especially Brenda Wiederhold and others have been doing um, phobia desensitization in VR for ages, you know, since I, you know, I've been in the field well over 20 years and they were already established, you know, when I, when I have um, uh, joined in, we could say. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, I just think because it, it makes sense to us, you know, I think one of the things as sort of patients and, um, research, you know, for everybody, really, you want to kind of understand the mechanism if you can. And I think those, uh, not to say that we scientifically completely understand the mechanism, but I think people can see it. They can say, okay, you know, if I'm in pain, I know sometimes distraction works. I could see how this might be sort of ultimate distraction. Um, there are other mechanisms now that people are working on, but that was sort of the first easiest, um, you know, one to go with. Um, and then for phobia desensitization, I mean, yeah, like we're going to put somebody in their environment, but they can be here in the room and, you know, the, their therapist can be with them. And um, so I think they just made so much sense. But now I think we're we're starting to get a little more creative. We're starting to test things out, um, you know, and there are a lot of other use cases that have arisen with a ton of evidence, you know, around things like um, rehabilitation. Um, autism is a big use area now. Um, you know, especially around training. So I, you know, I think there are a lot of really amazing um, emerging uses, but you know, I think there's more to come. I think mm -hmm. there's lots, so many creative people out there. Um, you know, the only thing I, I do always sort of want to, you know, the caveat I always want to give is that, mm -hmm. you know, it, it does tend to be a problem when you approach it as, you know, here's a tool, let's figure out where it works, mm -hmm. you know, as opposed to starting with the problem. Um, and I think um, we're starting to get good at knowing what kinds of problems we can solve um, with immersive tech. And so, you know, it, it may be more of a question of looking to our, our clinical colleagues, um, our, our patient friends, you know, and sort of saying, okay, well, what, what are the problems? And then saying, okay, well, is this, this may not be appropriate, but, you know, maybe we can use our creativity and, and what we know and come up with other solutions as well. Yeah, we must stay aligned to the need. I, I agree with you completely. Um, and some of the needs we have are super complex, which is, which is also a big problem within healthcare. Um, but they, I've also seen some interesting things around helping clinicians, right? These things are not purely a, cl a clinician to patient piece, but with the burnout rates um, and stress that we're seeing, uh, we've done a number of reach live talks with individuals that are looking at sensory forms of technology, so creating an entire room which allows using smell and visuals to kind of help bring blood pressure points down and, and give people a moment to tap, detach and deal with whatever they've just seen because they're just working at such a rate. In terms of being at the cusp of seeing as much as you see, where does equity come in? You, you're someone that speaks to health equity. 
and yeah. you speak to um, the importance of it. Yet yeah, you're in probably what one would consider right now a very niche space uh, in terms of immersive tech. Yeah. So what what do you say to that? What's the work that you're putting in or the team are putting in in terms of health equity? Yeah, yeah. So I think um, in terms of health equity, it's really interesting and it's really multifaceted. Um, and I think part of the reason I'm able to uh, address it as much as I am is because I also work in genomics and genomics is a place uh, with uh, a long history of, yes, problems. Um, and then also people who want to sort of solve those problems where we've been really, really attuned to equity uh, for, you know, for quite a long while, especially the place where I work um, and is really first and foremost. Um, and so I've been able to kind of take those, uh, you know, those, um, you know, those way of those lenses, you know, sort of on the emerging tech and, and apply them sort of across all the work that I do. Um, and so, you know, I think with um, our immersive tech, it's going to be um, really important because, yes, it is one of the emerging technologies. We know, you know, over and over and over again um, that access to new technologies is um, basically never equitable um, mm -hmm. and that it takes a lot of time, you know, for these things to kind of trickle down in some way. Um, and you know, I think we have a chance, you know, we're sort of, we're, we're early, right? We're early in the ecosystem here and we have a chance to learn from the past and, you know, perhaps try to do a little bit better. So I think I could um, probably talk about three different ways um, that I think it's really important to um, combine, you know, sort of considerations of where the tech is going um, and how we might be able to use it to make healthcare more equitable um, and also make its own sort of introduction into healthcare more equitable. Um, so I guess one of the things that is sort of uh, easy to start with, at least, is that the technology itself um, could benefit us in terms of being able to get more um, cutting edge treatments out to people, even though providers you know, are sometimes at a shortage. Um, so being able to uh, use the tech to bring, you know, sort of uh, treatments out to people, you know, who may live in rural areas, who may be underserved. Um, you know, one of the cool things that people don't usually think about with VR is that a lot of the reason that, um, you know, older populations and others who are less, potentially less tech savvy might have trouble using some of the digital therapeutics and digital tech that has come before is because they're not particularly user friendly or the device that they're on um, isn't particularly user friendly. Um, and VR, you know, comes in many flavors, but there are ways to make it vary. You know, you open the box, you put it on, you want to do something, you move your arm in the way that you would in the real world to do it. So in a lot of ways, I mean, it can absolutely be designed in ways that are very inclusive and are very um, intuitive to use. It's just that we have to, you know, make, make sure people are willing and encouraged um, to design um, the capabilities in that way. Um, so that's one way I think that, you know, we may be able to um, actually just help based on the, the, the features of the tech itself. Now, beyond that, you know, I think um, another way that's, you know, maybe a little bit different is that uh, certainly we and others have been using immersive to um, better understand, um, you know, where bias discrimination, these related processes might actually be a problem in healthcare. Um, so I've done a fair amount of research where we can do things, you know, very simply, we make an avatar uh, playing a patient, you know, that virtual human can be white, she can be black, but the sound uh, file, you know, based on what she's going to say, her nonverbal movements, everything else is the same. So in research, what that means is we can, we can know the actual effect of, you know, perceiving somebody's race to be white or black or whatever else you're going to perceive it. We can know that that causal effect on uh, the reactions that a doctor might have, for example, um, in a medical interaction. And there we can start to identify what are the root causes for some of the problems we're seeing um, and start to think about ways we might be able to change them. And then of course, VR is being used for that as well. You know, I've seen a lot of compelling uh, use cases for anti-bias research, or not research even, for anti-bias training um, and sort of, you know, the empathy literature on using VR for empathy is, you know, it's pretty mixed. Um, but it, it has a lot of suggestions about design choices you can make to be able to use VR to effectively, you know, help people, um, into, you know, to sort of engender empathy in people. So I think um, there's a lot of direct uses where we can apply, um, 
you know, VR and XR more broadly in ways to, you know, study ways to reduce bias and then also to use it as a tool to do that sort of in and of itself. And then finally, I think, you know, the easy stuff is done, right? <laughs> so I think, you know, the hard part is that, you know, we probably have seen a lot of the um, early adopters come in. So I know, you know, with my friends at the VA, uh, you know, the, the people who are most interested, you know, are the clinics that are tending to use the tech. Um, the, the patients who are most interested in trying it are the ones who've tried it. Now we have the hard work, right? Now we have to reach out and do, you know, do the work, make the effort to figure out what the barriers are for other people. Um, because to some extent, yes, there will be always be sort of cost barriers and, and financial, you know, and access. But in that environment, at least, access isn't as big of a deal. And so who's coming to the table and who's not coming to the table? What are the concerns and how, you know, I think one of the, the you know, ideas there is, you know, get the headsets on the heads, right? Because people don't understand VR until they've tried it. Hmm. And so figuring out ways uh, to do the outreach to make sure that everybody has an opportunity to try it, to decide whether they would like it, and, you know, whether they think it will work for them. And then also to do the hard research to say, you know, will it work for everybody? You know, a lot of, you know, we have a, a, a history of clinical trials, you know, being um, historically done on white men um, for many, many years. And we are now in the clinical trial world just starting to say, okay, yeah, we, we can't do this, obviously. We need to know if these drugs or, you know, these treatments, for example, will, will work for everybody. Um, and I think we haven't embraced that yet uh, for clinical trials and VR uh, environments, uh, clinical tools like that. But, you know, I think we have to. Um, because I think until people try it um, and until we get everybody at the table, um, we really won't know sort of the best design choices. We won't know um, what works for who, um, yeah. how we might tailor, you know, all of those sorts of things. Completely. No, well, thank you. You gave a very comprehensive answer. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> to the different elements that are possible, really. And the the hard work is now uh, the design with intent, the thinking about our own biases um, and getting it. I love the phrase of getting it on, getting the headset. Like much like we used to say about the smartphone, getting the smartphone into people's hands. Um, right. Now it's about getting the headsets on uh, for people to experience it. I mean, it's there's a lot of delight. There's a lot of videos that show the first time someone's experienced mm -hmm. a VR headset or an immersive experience. Because it is really like, like it's quite a wow factor. Very few things in life nowadays can make you give that feeling of like something being wow. And um, and I can and that wonderment is something we could we it needs to be worked on to spread that uh, across to across to people and campaigning right. And, and health literacy is is a passion passion topic for mine. Uh, you know how do we make health accessible? And we're going to have to, you know, with the health system burdened as it is, individuals are seeking valid, credible information and solutions and tools. And I'd love to see more accessibility in every form, you know, people understanding okay. and getting access to information quickly online um, and, and all the way through to having experiential labs where they could go to to, to trial these things. Because that's how people have pivoted in to more tech is being seeing it in their local shopping mall, seeing these things accessible to them for an experience, it tips them in. Yeah. So how are we going to, in terms of, there's two areas now. What what are some of the, the ways that we could be increasing access? And is that down to the health system? Is it also down to technology companies? What's your view on that? And then the second part of it will be the building of evidence which is something that's very close to your heart and coming from an academic background and an institute, of course, you know, the more data you have, the more you can inform the future too. So let's start with the accessibility question. Mm -hmm. How, how do you see access increasing and is it whose responsibility? is? It? Yeah. You know, I think, I guess access cuts across a bunch of different lines because mm -hmm. you know, the, there are, different so many different ways in which the technology can be and will be used in medicine um and so you know some of it certainly you know is across the lines of uh, you know do you attend do you go to a major research hospital right for your care and those are the kinds of places now right now you're more likely to run into these technologies um you know so part of it is getting it so that 
it is easy. You know, this, this is maybe falling more on, well, I'm not going to start talking about standards because <laughs> standards mm -hmm. in VR are you know, everywhere right now. But, but, you know, sort of figuring out implementation wise what works, what's easy, what fits into the routines of um, medical professionals. Um, you know, right now the, the friction is, is too big. I think to get you know to get this sort of all over the place. So I think part I mean that is part research, and that's also part um, sort of design principles and um, you know talking to the stakeholders, right, and figuring mm -hmm. out what your um, average healthcare worker who could be using the technology, you know, what does their workflow look like? What do they need? Um, so some of it is just the practicalities of it. Um, of course, a lot of it will come down um, to money, and I'm not going to pretend I know how to. Um, fix all the money problems we, we have in our healthcare um, and how to get the, the, you know, the newest, best technologies um, out there. Um, but, you know, then the other piece of it, I think, is wellness and the sort of the non, um, you know, the things that are important, but not really regulated as much and not really um, as central in the, the sort of healthcare system. Um, and there, you know, I think it's kind of twofold. In some ways, it, we almost have too much access. Mm -hmm. um, I think we're, we're, uh, following some of the problems that we saw in, you know, maybe mobile phone apps and others where um, the stuff that seems to be effective can start to get sort of drowned out amid, you know, all of the applications out there that will say that they're for anxiety reduction. Um, does that mean clinical anxiety or does that mean just sort of I feel nervous? You know, what does it mean? What no. is out there? You know, how can we... Um, show that some of these things have actually demonstrated efficacy versus not. Um, it's mm. interesting in the VR landscape because it is more of a closed system right now. Um, and so I think there's a lot of, of players and a lot of things to figure out. Um, but I think being able to sort of identify the effective approaches, the effective applications, I mean, I think would go a long way, um, you know, if, if people could be made aware of what to choose. Otherwise, it's very overwhelming. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, and this is not the solution, but I mean, the number of my kids' friends who got um, Quest 2s for Christmas this year <laughs> is sort of astounding. Um, mm -hmm. Grandparents were busy out there getting their headsets. Um, but there are, you know, now admittedly, you know, more economically advantaged families, um, but there are a lot of headsets out there. You know, they're just people don't know what the options are. For using those headsets if they could say okay well you know why don't i take my kid's headset and use it you know to do some meditation or to address my chronic pain um that's starting to become a possibility but you know part of that is sort of spreading the word and getting uh you know some of those applications that work accessible and sort of um, highlighted i suppose um as a possibility so you know that's even another way in which um, we probably need to think about access as well. Mm, yeah, I love this vision of, um, you know, a younger part of the family who's really into it, passing it on to some other person and, and them lot, you know, the, the youngsters kind of really moving it up the chain and getting everyone to have an experience because that is really yeah. how people do dip into to try. And and yes, it. yeah, I mean, that's a really, that's a wonderful way to, to do it. Yeah. Um, you know, I, a lot of people I talk to when they hear that I work with the technology, they're like, oh, I, my kid has one or like, you know, my kid's friends have one, but I've never tried it. Mm. You should. Why, why, why would you not? You know, and then let's talk about how it may actually be useful um, in your life. Yeah. And then the evidence generation piece, which I think will help the clinical community also come up the ranks, right? Because we do all love a bit of uh, clinical trial data of, of <laughs> journal articles. Uh, so what, what do you feel about that? Do you feel there's enough being done to create appropriately diverse clinical trials across demographic, age groups, what have you? So what's, what's the situation from your, completely your perspective? Yeah, yeah, I think um, never enough. <laughs> well, I think that, um, you know, things are definitely taking off as far as rigorous clinical trials go. Um, I think for a long time, we kind of sat back and said, well, it's so new, it's so new, we're just gonna do a trial on, on 30 people, you know, we'll ask them how they feel before and after, and we have data, you know, and I think we're to the point now where I think we can kind of safely say like, eh, that's, that was fine, but now we really need to do rigorous clinical trials um, and really understand uh, the effect of these technologies. And, 
it's okay if they're not more effective than established approaches. I mean, that's great. If they're the same effectiveness, that would be wonderful um, because they, there's other features that, you know, they're um, non-invasive, you know, they're non-bumerological. There's, there's, they have all sorts of things going for them. Um, but, I, you know, I think uh, clinical trials are expensive. They're a high bar. Um, so I think we really are pretty early to the world of, you know, very rigorous, well-powered clinical trials with you know sort of serious control groups or serious comparator groups to compare the VR um, applications against. Um, however, what I've seen coming out has been you know really encouraging. You know, and I think there's something to all the positive findings that have happened mm -hmm. you know in the last five seven years. Uh, they're not coming out of nowhere. It's just that you know we don't have the kind of rigorous evidence we would really need um, in a lot of cases yet. Um, and you know the you know as we're talking the the populations on whom a lot of these things have been tested are you know, they tend to be convenience populations, right? They're mm -hmm. whoever's coming already to your academic medical center, um, you know, which is not a representative slice of the population, um, you know, so really having to work a little harder to diversify our participant pools, you know, and sort of make sure that um, things are working sort of across demographic groups and so on, I think is going to be really critical mm -hmm. coming up. And it, it is a requirement in a lot of areas for clinical trials and there's no reason you know it shouldn't be um, a requirement here as well so you know i think as people are working on standards and um you know the recommended approaches for mm -hmm. evidence generation you know i think it's a really important facet of that yeah just been thinking about this as as, as we've been doing uh, this having this conversation and you know the, the other thing that i think is really important around technology and just treatment overall is as we move to a future which one hopes is personalized, right? That is driven by the uniqueness of me, by my biological makeup, by my background, by my you know education level, my choice set. I think we also need to move away from everything being for everyone. You know, this is an effective form of therapy. I mean, I've seen it. I've seen what it could do for like pain management, for example, for a period of time, the relief it can give. So it is effective in certain disciplines, in certain moments. And I think we need to work more to the point of who is it right for by doing a lot more um, diverse sets of tests across different demographics with different questions based on need, like circling back to the beginning. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Based and then offering it as a suite of a solution because it is there to, to, to help and support individuals, right? And, your world of genomics and immersive tech is just so fascinating to me because the future is personal. The future has to be personal. I mean, I'm fighting for that now, but I'm privileged. Mm -hmm. I'm privileged because I have choice. So mm -hmm. tell me more about, these will be your parting words for today as we wrap okay. mm -hmm. live today because we're coming close to time. So for, for you, uh, rather than talk about the future of VR because it still is nascent and moving, immersive tech is still moving, but right. what is the future? How will we get to a more personalized health future? What's your vision and, and hope for that? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, I mean, ultimately it's the ability to harmonize and have sort of data streams talk to each other um, in some ways, um, because there are so many facets of, of me, of you, that could be informing the right treatment for us. Um, and, and some of that certainly, you know, may very well be genetic, um, some of it might just be, you know, sort of our biomarker response to different um, uh, nutrition, to, you know, pharmaceuticals, whatever. But a lot of it is also our mindset, you know, do, I mean, you, well, placebo effect, very effective, right? Do we think it's going to work? Um, you know, there, are, you know, that's a very obvious one, but there are all kinds of other sort of orientations towards um, treatment and technology and why we think, you know, what's our mental model of why, you know, we are um, affected by, you know, whatever health conditions we might be affected by. Um, so there are just so many facets um, that could feed into these models. And, you know, we've been pinning our hopes on genetics for a really long time. It hasn't borne out in the way I think any of us hoped it would. Um, it could still. Um, but, you know, it's sort of like we've got to look beyond sort of the, the usual suspects in a lot of ways. Um, and, you know, VR itself, when you use it, generates a lot of data, right? And so we are 
constantly our movement, you know, 60, 90 times a second is being captured. And there's a lot of things somebody could do with that movement data, a lot of potential problems that, you know, we can talk about another day, but there's a lot of great stuff, you know, we can gather from somebody's walking path in a VR environment to tell about their health. You know, so there's just so many ways that um, data can be captured and fed back in. Um, so I, I think a lot of it is is sort of um, infrastructure and logistics and, you know, technology um, related, but people are working really hard on, on these issues. So, I'm, you know, I'm kind of hoping um, we might be able to make ourselves a really robust digital twin one day um, and, uh, you know, sort of capture and integrate all of these different important streams of data. Yeah, I, I, I'm with you. I think we, it will happen. And some of the technology we've seen already around digital twins is, is fascinating and it can only get better and more accurate. So thank you so much. Thank you for being with us on Reach Live. And a uh, big thank you to everyone that joined us. Um, as always, please subscribe. We are on YouTube, it's on LinkedIn, um, and I'm sure other forums too. So please be sure to follow Reach Live, be a subscriber, and we'll be back next month with another wonderful digital health speaker. Thank you so much. Thank you.